in the intense world of medical emergencies. One patient, three times stab wounds. There's nothing more extreme than a code red. So this is a two-car RTC. That's correct. It means there's an immediate threat to life. Got one male still trapped in the vehicle. In the West Midlands, a highly specialist team are on call 24-7, ready to race to these major traumas. Four minutes. By road and air. Zero three, we are lifted from Cosford. Responding to the most severe 999 calls. Open up the Lucas device over there for me. Day and night. All right, well done. From car crashes. Yeah, just need to check. To stabbings. You're going to put some oxygen on your pals. Here, where time is critical, lives will be saved. Ah. On roadsides, in back gardens, and inside homes. It's okay, coming off the chest. These emergency doctors and paramedics use cutting edge trauma techniques and surgery normally only seen in operating theatres to save people from almost certain death. Oh, sorry, mate. Oh, no, mate. Oh, no. We're going to sort you out. Filmed over two months with the critical care team. Ready, set, slide. We captured every vital second as these specialist crews work to save lives. On roll, ready, steady, roll. Tonight, in a rush hour collision, a motorcyclist is thrown headfirst from his bike. Mate, can you hear us? He hasn't got a radio pulse. Is he breathing? A builder's leg is sliced open. That piece of metal has gone through your skin. You can see muscle and fatty tissue. A man in cardiac arrest. Anything on that ECG? And medics' lives are in danger as they treat a patient with suspected coronavirus. Hi, guys. Um, we're not going to come in just yet. We're just going to have a chat to you, if that's all right. Clear guard, breathing filter. It's Monday morning and the start of shift for Pete Edwards. I don't know whether I'm a morning person. I, you know, the first hour or so, I take a little bit to warm up. He's been working in the ambulance service for 15 years, the last two as a highly trained critical care paramedic. It's just the initial getting up, isn't it? Get a cup of coffee, and that's it. It's all, it's all, it's all good then. Get the vehicle checked, and then it'll be on to uh, crew welfare, as we call it. But today, there is no time for any morning cuppa. I'm at service. Is the patient breathing? Let me just go over. Is he breathing? He is breathing. Is he conscious? Uh, no, he isn't conscious. He's bleeding quite badly. He's telling me to come off. Got a severe gas wound to the top of his head. Was it a car versus a motorbike? Yeah, car versus motorbike. We're heading towards a patient that has been reportedly hit by a car. The initial call said the patient was in cardiac arrest, so it obviously sounds quite serious. An ambulance has already been dispatched, but the biker is thought to be so badly injured that Pete and another critical care team are being sent to give life-saving treatment. Because of the nature of the job, they've also responded to Helimed 03 uh, with a medic on board, and that'll be coming from Cosford. Helimed 03, a Midlands Air Ambulance, is also scrambled. On board is another critical care paramedic and a trauma doctor qualified to carry out roadside surgery. 6-2 at scene. Once on scene, Pete is briefed by the ambulance crew. Hi, guys. Hi. How are we doing? <laughs> Helmet came off in the crash. Has he been speaking to us? Not at all. He's been like this since we got in. OK. 21-year-old Curtis has been thrown from his motorbike after colliding with a car. In the impact, his helmet came off before his head hit the road. <laughs> OK. Uh, He's a bit agitated, isn't he? He's agitated. <laughs> Curtis has a severe head wound. It's quite common when we get this sort of patient, big head injury, start getting agitated. He doesn't, it's not intentional, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's got a really reduced level of consciousness. He says, he got a radial pulse? Yeah. Okay, let's see if he'll tolerate an oxygen mask, all right? Let's pull his stuff out. Yeah, that's it. 
We'll see if we can get him onto the uh, scoop as best we can. His GCS, his eyes are open. To try and evaluate him, Pete uses the GCS, or Glasgow Coma Scale. Mate, can you hear us? You shall have a song for you. A scoring system that helps describe the level of consciousness. A normal score for speech is five. Verbally, it's probably a two, isn't it? Further indication that Curtis may have a traumatic brain injury. We want to protect his brain, and by taking over his ventilation and us doing it instead of him, we can protect his brain and stop it swelling, hopefully. That means putting him to an induced coma. Breathing automatically with a ventilator will allow Curtis's brain time to rest, calming the swelling. But an induced coma is a risky procedure, usually only carried out in hospital. Are we treating it as life-threatening this time? I would say it's got the potential for that, yeah. The critical care team carry drugs and anaesthesia normally only used in hospital operating theatres and intensive care units. We start the interventions that they start in hospital, we start them early and get people to hospital in the best shape that, that we can. I'm just going to get some midazolam and then at that point we'll put them onto my ventilator because it's, it's just a bit better for them, that's OK. In cardiac arrest cases, these roadside treatments can make the difference between life and death. Ambulance services are patient breathing. He's passed out. I can hardly feel him breathing. So he's not breathing very often at all? No. You at home? Yes, I'm the wife. He's sitting in the car. The next door neighbours. Okay, call. brilliant. Put your neighbour on the phone for me. Hello. Are we able to get him out of the car and onto the floor? We can do, yes. You do yes. that straight away for me. You need to start doing some basic life support. Uh, oh, my God, I've never done this before. I can talk you through it, sweetheart. Uh, what I need you to do is start pushing yeah. down hard and fast, OK? You need to go two times a second. One, go, yeah, two, that's one, it. Keep going at that two, speed. Fantastic one, job. Two, one, two. Now, don't one, worry one, about pushing too hard, OK? Keep one, your arms straight and just keep going for me. One, two. <laughs> yeah, it's on its way. Yes, it's already on its way, darling. I've got them coming to you as quickly as I can get them there. They are coming on blue lights, OK? An 80-year-old man is in cardiac arrest. As well as dispatching an ambulance, the code red emergency is passed to critical care paramedic Rob Davies. Go ahead. In cardiac arrest, the brain stops sending signals to the heart. It stops beating and oxygen ceases to pump around the body. Only one in ten of hospital cardiac arrest patients survive. What was the call connect time, please? Yeah, uh, the call connect was at 15.52. Yeah, 15.52, call time. Yeah, Roger. Without CPR, the brain can be irreparably damaged in just six minutes. The call connect time that I asked for is the time that the call comes into the ambulance service, so that'll hopefully give me a fairly accurate time of when the cardiac arrest was identified. So we're about 10, 10 or 12 minutes into that. Rob arrives 14 minutes after the call, by which time the ambulance crew are already on scene. How are we doing, guys? You right? Yeah, good. How are we doing? Still breathing for himself? Brilliant. Feeling unwell, Eight-year-old Keith asked his wife, Monica, to drive them home. As they arrived, he collapsed. Have you prescribed anything? Um, yes, but he'd stopped. I took the note. Right. He just looks like he's in there. He's all in a quick time frame. He was making some gurgling noises. Fine, she's pulled up, gone inside, called for us, neighbour stopped to help. OK. So it's all in a quick time frame. A neighbour gave Keith CPR and got his heart beating again. He was making some respiratory, mild respiratory effort during the CPR. One shot for turn circulation. Beautiful. Good work. I'll just go and draw some drugs up, right? 
So the gentleman's had some bystander basic life support, some chest compressions. On the arrival of the paramedic, he's found his heart to be in a rhythm that he can shock. He's given him a shock through the defibrillator and now he's got a pulse back. I'm just going to drop a little bit of sedation just so that we can help with his breathing. Let's have him up and out then. Although Keith's heart is now beating, there's a danger it could stop again. And then we'll just put, place him on there. Up to 79% of hearts re-arrest before reaching okay. hospital. We got him up and away. Critical care paramedics like Rob are specially trained to fight those odds. Sold his arm there, chap. I can't reach it. There we go. Right. So, plan is then if somebody can stay in the back with me, what I'd like to do, we can have a little look and just see if we can give him a little bit of sedation and then perhaps just get him onto an eye gel. To ensure sufficient oxygen reaches his lungs, Rob must insert an eye gel tube down Keith's throat so the paramedic can control his breathing. Yeah, I think I put a lube on it. Okay, so just go with him on that. Can you do the ECG? An ECG or electrocardiogram records the electrical activity of the heart. Just give him a little bit of sedation just so that we can ventilate him a bit better. We might look at a bit more of that. Okay, let's have the rest of these clothes off. Uh, anything on that ECG? All right, chap. Georgie, how long to the QE? Uh, about 15 minutes. 15. Lovely. Smooth, but rapid, lovely. Keith is seriously ill, but Rob's goal is to get him to the nearest cardiac centre alive. OK. He's still going against that a little bit, is he? We can go. <laughs> Dr Matt Rowley and critical care paramedic Tom Waters are starting their shift just as paramedic Kerry Penn Ashman is finishing hers. Remember your PPE, remember to wipe over the car. These medics are used to facing danger, but at the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, the level has significantly increased. Following the corona outbreak, how we approach people and how safe we've got to be has just completely changed. Coronavirus has huge implications for us as healthcare professionals, and it means that we're having to be more careful about how we protect ourselves. We're having to carry quite a bit of PPE, which is personal protective equipment, stuff that protects us against um, this particular virus. Without PPE, patients might unknowingly infect the medics with COVID-19 and the medics might infect their patients with a deadly virus. Because there's a potential that we're going down to the patient's face, that we're going to do things that might mean that the, the patient is going to get droplets of sputum, any sort of bodily fluid, into our space. So you have a hood that fits on, onto your face, that goes over the top of your head, and then you have a little um, portion there that fits onto these sorts of respirators and you put that on your face and that gives you quite a few hours, potentially about six hours, um, of good, clean air. For most of the critical care team, the need for PPE in the eye of a pandemic is a new experience, but not for paramedic Tom. Did Tom tell you he was out uh, when the Ebola outbreak happened as well? Went out to volunteer, didn't you? Bit of a hero, aren't you, really? Services, a patient breathing. Not very well. Are they awake? No, he's unconscious. How old? A really he's 60. Is it regular no, breathing? No, he's not regular it's breathing. Not. Okay. He was no, just standing at the end of the bar. Yeah. He just dropped to the floor. He backed his head on the edge of the bar. And he went unconscious. We're coming as quickly as we can. Yeah. Don't be alarmed if they're coming wearing face masks. Okay. Oh, right. Well, okay. Please yeah. don't be yeah. worried about that. Not 
a collapsed man with a suspected head trauma can be a Category 1 emergency. Yeah, I can. That should have come through now. A local ambulance is almost at scene, and 30 miles away, Tom and Dr Matt are en route, but want to know if the patient could be a risk to them. Have we got any symptoms that are suspicious of COVID for this chap before uh, we go anywhere near? I believe that was affirmative. He's high risk for COVID. He come through with um, coughing and uh, difficulty breathing. As the patient has suspected coronavirus symptoms, the medics need to wear their PPE, but it takes several minutes to put on. Precious time that could be used treating him. With the with the nature of um, of what's going on at the moment, we need to make sure that we protect ourselves with our personal protective equipment and all make a decision from there. Tom and Dr Matt might need to save their patient's life while knowingly risking their own. If we need to do advanced procedures and interventions, we will do them, but we have to balance that against the, the personal risk and also the risk of not delaying that patient getting to hospital. I think definitely when we go back, we need to get the hoods and stuff out now. In Albury, critical care paramedic Pete is treating 21-year-old Curtis, who has been thrown headfirst from his motorbike after colliding with a car. Let's just try and keep him as still as we can, all right? The impact dislodged his helmet, and he now has a suspected brain injury. Pop his legs onto there. We'll get him on the stretcher. He's, he'll think he's a bit hypertensive because I can't feel a radial pulse. Curtis's condition is so serious that he needs a trauma doctor to put him into a coma to protect his brain. But the air ambulance carrying one is still eight minutes away. I think the priority, right, if we can get him on the back of the vehicle and we can do a proper assessment on him, we'll get some access. Curtis is losing blood from his head, but his weak pulse indicates internal bleeding too. We'll get full monitoring on him. We'll see what his BP is. I suspect his BP might be low. So it may be that he needs some TXA, all right. Well, if we could get some head blocks on just to keep his head still, all right. So you've got IV access, on. Nice one, all right. Is that the TXA, is it? Yeah. Pete needs to give Curtis tranexamic acid, or TXA, which helps prevent excessive blood loss. Let's get full monitoring on him, if we can, and let's see what his observations are. Let's cut his trousers off and get that skin to skin. All right. The doctor on board the air ambulance is now just moments away, but Curtis is deteriorating by the second. Is he breathing? Yeah. His rest is very shallow. It's obviously quite pearly. Let's get an airway in him if we can. What we might need is a BVM as well once we've got that. So let's get that eye gel in first. 29 minutes after the 999 call, the Midlands Air Ambulance arrives with critical care paramedic Ryan James and trauma doctor Ben Taylor. He's collided with that car or the car's collided with him. Yeah. He's thrown him off, his helmet's come off in the impact. He's got a big head injury. He's been spontaneously breathing, although he's very shallow. I'm setting up for RSI. I'll have you set up carrying Yeah, yeah. I'll assist all right, yes, please, happy, yeah. Is that all right? Yeah, sort of drugs out. Yeah. He's had some TXA due to mechanism. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've drawn some ketamine off. Um, there's 160 left there, Ben, because he's had 40 out of my 200. The critical care team use a range of powerful anaesthetics, like ketamine, not carried by ambulance crews. They can also perform procedures normally only done in hospital. I'm going to give an anaesthetic just to um, protect, his, protect his brain and give him the best possible chance of recovering from his injuries. Putting Curtis into an induced coma might give his brain precious time to recuperate and encourage any dangerous swelling inside his skull to subside. So to the next five minutes. To place Curtis into a coma, he first requires RSI, rapid sequence induction, an advanced critical care respiration procedure that Pete decides is safest to do outside the ambulance. Because the process is, is quite risky, we need to have 360-degree access. So if, 
the patient starts to deteriorate for any reason or we're having difficulty with the airway, we've got good access and we're not sort of fighting over each other. Dr Ben then prepares to put Curtis into a coma with two injections, a sedative and a paralysing agent. BVM. Yeah, on. Entitled. is on, yeah. reading at 3.0. BP systolic. The last systolic was 127. And cycle set. Cycle set every three minutes automatic. Saturations. Yeah. OK, drugs going in now. OK, fentanyl's in. Ketamine is Five. in. OK, everybody ready? OK. So, oxygen mask is coming off. OK, there's no loose teeth that we've seen. So, I've got the blade and I'm going to open his mouth as wide as I can. We've got a video scope first yeah. with a size 4 blade. Okay, we've got a backup of a Mac 4. Yeah. Patches check charges. Okay. A laryngoscope, a camera with a screen, allows Pete to look into Curtis's airway for obstructions. I'm going down the right hand side of his mouth, sweeping the tongue to the left, and I'm going to walk down as I go and looking for landmarks. I've got the epiglottis, but... OK, a bit of suction, please. Suction. It's quite a lot of phlegm at the back of his throat. Okay. What's your view like? OK. I've got a grade one view there. I can see the cords. With a clear path, the breathing tube can be inserted into the trachea. OK, I think through the cords and the black line we are 22 at the teeth, Ben. OK, okay we've got misting of the tube. Yeah. OK, I'm coming out with the blade. Cheers, thanks. Curtis is now in an induced coma and breathing with the aid of a ventilator. Dr Ben and the ambulance crew have done all they can. Just nice and steady, buddy. Okay. The importance of our services, um, we're bringing some of the emergency department to the patient, rather than the patient having to wait to get to the emergency department. He's been anaesthetised a lot faster by us getting a doctor quickly to see him, so we've saved him some time and hopefully improved his outcome that way. Critical care paramedic Alistair McNeil has just come on shift and romance is in the air. It is Valentine's Day today, so whether we'll get any uh, squabbles between couples, you never know. Paramedics are much more likely to deal with violent crime than lovers' tiffs. Last year, there were over 90,000 in the West Midlands alone, many ending with on-street life-saving trauma treatment. Ambulance service, hi please. Father has beaten son with a pole, potentially. The son has a hole in his head and he's bleeding. The son's 37 and the father is age 63. Now, there are a lot of blood there, can we ask? There's a bloody dripping. Brain matter cannot be seen. Uh, however, there is a big hole. A violent assault likely to result in catastrophic brain injury is an immediate Category 1 emergency. So we're often addressing Dudley, uh, which is coming through as a serious assault, I believe. Somebody battered with a pole. With over 14,000 physical assaults a year on emergency workers, critical care paramedics like Alistair are in real and present danger. Potentially some suggestion whoever's got this pole and has been battering somebody is still on scene or near to scene. I believe control are liaising with police for finding um, a standby point for us. Six to over. When you go to the junction where the Tesco is, probably just pull in there. Yeah, mate, that's all received. I can picture where you mean. Uh, Speak to me. Sounds like there is somebody who's carried out potentially a serious assault. His patient may have potentially fatal brain injuries, requiring urgent trauma care. But for his own safety, before Alistair can approach the scene, the police must declare it safe. 
The annoyance is that we could be delaying care here. The police know far more about this than we do. Critical care paramedic Tom Waters and trauma doctor Matt Rowley are on their way to a collapsed patient displaying symptoms of coronavirus. And they've just heard that the man's condition has become critical. So there's a, uh, an ambulance crew on scene with a patient who has had a cardiac arrest. They've resuscitated him and managed to get his heart restarted again. Because his heart has been stopped for a period of time, there's been a lack of oxygen going to his brain. So now that his heart has restarted, he's quite agitated and combative and they're struggling to manage him at the moment. So we're going to try and intercept them on the way to the hospital and um, see if we can offer anything, potentially uh, giving this man an anaesthetic to stabilise his condition and transfer him onto a hospital. They've decided to meet the ambulance en route as it will save time and ensure the patient gets vital treatment as quickly as possible. We're going to make a rendezvous point four. We're thinking M42 Junction 9, a crew only just leaving scene, so that looks like it's going to be the best place. The issue that we've got with this patient is they're quite a long way away, so the plan ideally is going to be for them to load the patient on the ambulance if it's safe and then travel towards us and us meet them on the way to hospital just to try and save delay in any time there. If we're looking um, to either side, it's going to be an uh, aerosol generating procedure. So this triggers for high risk PPE, um, so that's for high risk PPE. Yeah, well, I mean, we are at the uh, RVP anyway. We'll wait for the crew to get to us. If the patient's heart stops again, Matt and Tom may have to perform life-saving interventions in the closed confines of an ambulance on a patient suffering a killer virus. If so, they'll need their PPE, but it takes 10 minutes to put on. So what we might do is just open the door, just chat to them, and then make a decision from there. All right, guys, you're right. Um, we're not going to come in just yet. We're just going to have a chat to you, if that's all right. From our understanding, it's a cardiac arrest. You've then shocked him, or...? No, no shock. No, no shock. CPR, uh, two lots of adrenaline. OK. And we got the Ross back. Yeah. Went off again. CPR. I honestly think that by the time we've donned, it's going to take us 20 minutes. So I think if you're happy, we just drive, we'll follow behind you. It's not a point of us not wanting to do it, but I think by the time we've done it, we'll be there. OK. Perfect, yeah, I'm over that. This patient has an airway, is a GCS of 15, is bradycardic. So we are 10 minutes Tom and Matt decide the best course of action is to follow the ambulance and not delay its journey further. So the plan currently is to follow the crew into hospital. Should they need any assistance, then we're here, we'll have to pull over and have to get our PPE on. But ultimately, the best thing for this chap is to get him to hospital as quick as possible. Pete, just planning ahead, um, have you spoke to Harlands? Because obviously if we put this in as a high-risk COVID, um, it's going to put the hospital into a, probably a bit of a state of emergency. Have you had a discussion with Harlands already regarding this? Um, I haven't, no, but I certainly can do. The emergency departments will have a protocol that they now follow for patients that will attend with suspected COVID-19. Again, that is probably going to tie up a significant amount of staff so yeah, it's probably going to need an RSR on arrival. So again, if you do do the high-risk COVID thing, that'll be great, and we'll be there in just under 10. It's cumbersome and time-consuming to put on, but over the next few weeks and months, the NHS will come to rely on supplies of PPE like never before. Quite rightly, the ambulance 
crew that had treated him had put their high-risk personal protective equipment on, which involves a suit, boot covers and a respirator so that they're not breathing any, any infected air or any infected air droplets around them. For us to do that would probably take around 10 minutes for myself and Tom to both put our PPE on. So that's 10 minutes wasted where the patient needs to be at hospital and at definitive care. So because the patient was relatively stable at this point, we made the decision not to delay things further, but to escort the crew to hospital with us being available should he need any interventions. The patient is transferred into a COVID-19 ready cardiac unit. Numbers at the moment, pulse 115, 14191, end tidal 4.2, saturated 6%, but he's cold. In Hales Owen, critical care paramedic Rob Davies is en route to hospital with eight-year-old Keith, who is critically ill following a cardiac arrest. Go 50 um, to start off with. Does that sound reasonable? His condition is so serious, Rob phones ahead to discuss his plans for treating Keith. My plan is to give him some rocuronium just so that I can just better ventilate him. Rocuronium bromide, or ROC, relaxes the muscles and allows the team to completely control Keith's breathing and optimise the oxygen getting into his body, which is vital after a cardiac arrest. He's probably uh, 80 kilos, something like that. So 50 seems about reasonable, doesn't it? We've got a good end tidal trace. A correct dosage is crucial. Essentially, what we're trying to do is buy some time to keep the major organs oxygenated, primarily, you know, the brain, heart and lungs. I'm going to have that out to some vomit there. But Keith's condition worsens when he begins to vomit. To prevent him from choking, Rob uses a suction probe to clear Keith's mouth and throat. Let's just have the... I think you've got it there. I'll just go down the side. So the end tidal, I think, is blocked now, so you can hear it, yeah. Vomit blocking his ventilation tube could starve Keith's brain and other vital organs of oxygen. I'm just going to get a new end tidal. What we're going to do, I'm just going to swap that out and swap that straight onto there. Okay, so if you vent on that, that one can go on the floor. And we've got an tidal back. Airway cleared, Keith stabilises and now has a chance of survival. Early bystander CPR and early defibrillation make a massive difference into this patient group. By doing that CPR, we then have a viable heart, which to shock. And if, if nothing was done for that gentleman, I think it would be, well, no, it would be a very, very different outcome. What I'd like to do is just strip all this off him. Doesn't need these. 52 minutes after the 999 call, the ambulance arrives at hospital, where Keith is handed over to the team in A&E. OK, let's go. Uh, so he's got pulse back. We tried to sort his airway out. It's quite difficult. He's on a ventilator, and it'll be 24, 48 hours, I think, before they perhaps try and wake him up and see how he is um, neurologically. Critical care paramedics undergo two years of specialist training for code red emergencies. Right, we're going to cut this off. Whether it's resuscitating a person in cardiac arrest or saving someone after a horrific accident. You're doing a great job, sit well done. Nice deep breaths, nice deep breaths. Keep going. Well 7062, go ahead. And a call's just come through that's about to test the trauma skills of critical care paramedic Steve Mason. Roger, thanks a lot for that. Ambulance service to the patient breathing? Uh, yes. What's happened? Um, had a cut leg, quite a bit of blood loss. Right, what, what's it? Uh, it's a basement construction site. 
He's cut his leg on something down there. How much blood did he say he's lost? Fine. Don't move in. Right. Google will be there as soon as we can. Accidents on building sites can be extremely challenging for the critical care teams. Dealing with life-threatening injuries in hazardous environments calls for calm under pressure. An ambulance crew is already on scene, but because of the potential severity of the accident, critical care paramedic Steve is also en route. Uh, 62, just arriving on scene. Is there any other resource on scene? Uh, the crew were booked to attendance 1406, over. Soon after the hoarding, take a left. OK, cheers, buddy. Thank you. Arriving at the site of a large office block development, Steve is directed down to the basement level. Roger, made contact. Yeah. Let him lift up with his good leg. There we go. Shift it across onto here. 59 year old Mark is being looked after by colleagues who bandage the wound with a towel to try and stop the bleeding. Step back. What, and that's yeah. a, it's not really sharp, is it? Quite yeah. sharp? It's not, not even sharp, is it? It's just. Yeah, yeah. Mark was carrying some pipe when he fell two metres onto the end of a scaffolding pole, which has sliced into his calf, leaving a wound at least two inches deep. 62, just a brief update. Got 59. Uh, can't get any signal around here, so. <laughs> With no signal underground, Steve is unable to contact the regional trauma desk to ask them to alert the hospital that Mark may need urgent surgery. The ambulance crew carry him out to the back of the ambulance where Steve can properly assess the wound. So how did you do it? Try and take some pipe down, I just lost it for him. So he must have fallen down because it's it's not that sharp, is it? But because I suppose with your body weight falling yeah, down, yeah. probably yeah, caused yeah. it to go through your car. Was it spurting, you know, or...? Well, I didn't do spurting, but it was coming out pretty fast. Was it? Okay. He's already lost a pint of blood. If the wound is spurting, it means Mark might have cut a major artery. Just get ready, just in case it starts spurting. In Dudley, there are reports of a serious assault a code red emergency. Sounds like there is somebody who's carried out potentially a serious assault and could well come back to this address, so I don't really want to be in somebody's living room when somebody comes back with a, a weapon. Critical care paramedic Alistair McNeil is awaiting police protection before he can approach the house. Six to over. How many paramedic police on scene? I'll go and have a look if they're happy. Once given the all clear, police give Alistair a brief assessment of the scene. It's 4.25 p.m. Hello. Do you right? Yeah. Have we got a large hole in the head or not? Two yeah. males in here, yeah. One's got an injury to his mouth and fucking smacked in the face. Right. And the other one's got a... The injury I can see is on his head here. Bit of okay. a wound, maybe, about that. Fair enough. Well, let's just come and have a look at him then. Okay. Yeah, very sad. Right, folks, what's happened to you both? He's got, he's got it, dog. He's to the end. Okay. Push to the floor, and he's to the end, yeah. Okay. Any weapons used on you? No. No? And is it literally just your heads that have been hit? Oh, Were you knocked oh, out when this happened? Can you remember? Oh, yeah. Go on, remember. All oh, right. Harry says he and his son Alan were attacked on their way home from the pub, but no weapons were used. How much have you had to drink? Can you remember? Or do you know, Harry? How much have you both had today? A few cans. Look at my nose. <laughs> A drunken brawl is not usually a code red emergency, but Alistair is concerned by Alan's demeanour. And while you've been with him, has he been drowsy like this? Because he's a bit sleepy. Was he like that beforehand because of the alcohol? Or is this...? He's concerned Alan may have concussion, a type of traumatic brain injury. I guess we're heading towards Ali Poppins Hospital. 
Yeah, you know, I'd say probably yay, because of the, the drowsy, yeah. Which comes to you, Alan. Are we popping you down the hospital? You're a little bit drowsy with a little bit of a lump on your head. I'm all right. Yeah, the problem, Harry, is he's a bit drowsy, isn't he? Well, we're talking to you and you're aware. <laughs> he keeps sort of nodding off to sleep. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm sorry, Mr. We really are not going to win, are we? I don't think we're quite at a point where we can force. Because Alan is just about conscious, the law says Alistair cannot make him go to hospital. We'd really like him to get some attention in hospital. It is what it is, I'm afraid. I just can't make them go anywhere. If you can't wake him up at some point in the next hour or two, yeah. you need to call 999. Oh, OK. okay? okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that's giving you serious concern, yeah. we need to know okay. and come back. Thank yeah. You. Make sure you ring us if something changes. OK. And so he was bleeding quite a lot. Can you move your foot? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Good. On a Birmingham building site, construction worker Mark has lost a lot of blood after falling and ripping open his right calf on a scaffold pole. And that's the only injury that you've got. Yeah, you've got yeah. one, yeah. Colleagues bandage the wound but now critical care paramedic Steve needs to assess the injury and see if it requires immediate surgery. I'm going to cut your jeans up a bit, fella. OK, I'd like... So, did you get the, the bandage ready? A serious arterial wound can result in death in five minutes. So, who did this? Your colleagues? Nice, yeah. yeah, they did really well, then, to stop. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit soughed. Mm. OK, so what we'll do, I'll cut it, keep the pressure on it and then lift, and then yeah. have a quick cursory look. You know. The soak through temporary dressing is removed to reveal an eight inch wide gaping wound. Oh, so let us cover it up so I can see muscle and fatty tissue. You know, it needs some cleaning yeah. and hospital. Probably need to go to theatres for it just to get it washed out. Yeah. That piece of metal has gone through your skin and gone mm. through the muscle uh, sort of layers. Yeah. But you've got a good circulation, you've got a good movement. Mm. So it's just an isolated injury. Uh, so we're just going to find out the best hospital to take you. Yeah. Confident that Mark isn't at risk of bleeding out, Steve now wants to get him to hospital as quickly as possible. Hi, baby, it's Steve. Uh, hi, mate. Yeah, it's not very good. So, you got a 59-year-old male patient that uh, he was working uh, up on uh, a little bit of a height and then he's sort of fallen back. And as he's fallen back, his right calf has gone past a, a metal sort of sharp object uh, and, and sort of torn his right calf open. But it is, it's the whole length of his right calf. So GCS of 15, heart rate of 68, uh, blood pressure of 167 over 73. It does look quite nasty. There's some skin loss, so I probably think it's probably best to go to the QE just because of this injury. Mark's wound may require a skin graft so he is sending him to the specialist doctors at Birmingham's Queen Elizabeth Hospital. So you don't want any pain relief at all? No. You're happy. With the situation under control, Steve decides to leave Mark in the care of the ambulance crew for the journey to hospital. Happy? Yeah, happy, thank you. Look after yourself. Thanks a lot, thanks Yeah. Man. No worries. All good. As Steve waits for his next emergency, he can reflect on how much worse things could have been for Mark. What we, we need to be worried about is people suffering with catastrophic hemorrhage. So if it had nicked an artery and they hadn't have got uh, pressure on that to stop that artery from bleeding, then things could be a lot worse. But although it does look quite bad, you know, hopefully it will make a, a speedy recovery.
A man's life hangs in the balance after a one-punch attack. The clock is ticking in 999, critical condition, back for a new series Thursday at 9. After the break, it's the North London prison that kept Britain's worst and most feared women behind bars. Inside Holloway is next.